and Professor Diane, uh, Professor Diane is one of my colleagues. I have, he's the director of entrepreneurship at North Carolina University at US. Uh, actually, she is participating in the area of entrepreneurship. She got a variety of papers worldwide published in a ranked journals. And Professor Diane is one of the nominated persons in this area. Uh, we have joint paper and was uh, this was my pleasure to, to write a paper with you on one day about women's entrepreneurship. So I need to welcome you in Galala University uh, to provide why entrepreneurship is needed. So if you could start, Professor Diane, it's going to be our pleasure to hear you during this webinar. I'm Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. But uh, okay. we are all sitting in the, in, the, in, in the auditorium room. So maybe the voice is not going to be clear for them to, 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 to hear you back. OK, so well, we greetings. Back. Greetings, everyone, from University of North Carolina, Greensboro. We're in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is in the middle of the state. And we have mountains about two hour drive to the west and uh, the ocean is about two hours to the east. So we're right in the middle. And um, we are hoping everyone is well there and we wish you the best. And, um, and I am very excited to have the opportunity to speak at Galala University with my dear professor friend, Rania, Rania. <laughs> and um, we, we uh, let me talk to you about why everyone should be an entrepreneur. So that's what our topic is today. And basically in today's economy around the world, it doesn't really matter where you are. Everyone has to be entrepreneurial. And I define entrepreneurship in my book Creative Cross-Disciplinary Entrepreneurship, a Practical View, published by um, Palgrave Macmillan in 2012. I defined entrepreneurship is to be creative and innovative in all you do that creates value. To be creative and innovative in all you do that creates value. So if you think personally about your own career or your own goals uh, for the students out there, what you want to do with your life, anything you want to do fits into entrepreneurship because you have to be creative and innovative in the sciences, in the math world, in music, in arts, in all aspects of whatever your career is. So here at the University of North Carolina Greensboro, I've created a program that combines entrepreneurship in learning objectives and in each class with each discipline. So we have 50 courses in 27 departments. Our program has won eight national and international awards. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've won the Legacy Award for Lifetime Achievement and Family business from the Family Firm Institute. And just last October, I was named uh, the Legacy Award for Lifetime Contributions to Entrepreneurship by the Global Consortium of Entrepreneurship Centers. So I'm really pleased to speak with you today and give you my perspective on why everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. So if we look at today's society, and this is true around the world, we've all been affected by COVID and um, the pandemic has made major differences in everyone's lives in your family life and your personal life, as well as your career life and in your student life. And um, I guess that's a recent example of how things can change so very quickly, so very fast in one year, look at what we've all experienced around the world. So there's no borders. 
when change happens. And change is something that will always come. And we know in today's society that change is even more quicker and more prevalent, if you think about it. Maybe some things stay the same. Thank God for those. Um, but we know that change happens at a much higher pace and much faster. And it doesn't matter what nationality you are, what country you're from, what region you're from, what religion you're at, change happens very quickly to all of us. And it's um, so prevalent. And with technology and the internet, it seems like it's even more prevalent. Well, this is gonna affect your job. It's gonna affect your future. There's gonna be differences in careers that you maybe um, opportunities that you never considered before that are going to come up and that you have to be ready to take advantage of those. And even if we look at careers in terms of um, corporate careers or careers in organizations, whether they're profit or nonprofit, as well as starting your own business, there's going to be major changes and everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. All organizations, whether they're for-profit, not-for-profit, public, government, everyone needs to be have employees that are creative and innovative in all they do, because they're going to be facing challenges and opportunities. And I always look at things as opportunities and not challenges. So if we look at what happened with COVID, many new businesses were created out of what happened worldwide then we lost a lot of businesses, right? And a lot of those businesses had to um, look for new opportunities or change what they were doing. So, you know, if you take restaurants, for instance, a lot of the businesses, uh, their business was all in-house dining, basically, you know, and now they have a lot of carry out. So, uh, one restaurant I, I was talking with just Saturday, my husband and I went out to dinner and both of us have both of our vaccines. So we're very lucky that way. And um, my husband works at a, a nursing home. So he was in the first group with the doctors. And for me, uh, the, they have immunized now all the professors and anybody at the university that works, and now they're doing the students. So this is this is very good. And so I'm all immunized. So we were able to go out to dinner for the first time in a year. And the booths are still every other booth and everybody is very six feet apart, very safe. Um, even the menus are disposable so they no one touches anyone else's. And I was talking to the manager and he told me that I said, well, your restaurant is very full and we had to wait one hour and a half to get a table. And he said, yes. And I called ahead for the reservation. They said, no, there is no reservations. You have to just come and wait. So we're waiting all six feet apart and everything. And then when we got the table, the the manager said, yes, um, we we're very busy. People are very anxious to go out and have some downtime to a little relax, to have some food that they miss, that maybe they don't cook at home and just, just some relaxation. And he said his business has actually increased 20% since COVID. And I said, how did that happen? Because uh, right now the the rules for restaurants hasn't changed here. It's the same as it was six months ago about the distance and everything. And he said, well, his carry out has increased 20%. Before they had hardly any carry out meals. Now 20% increase in, in carry out. And he said, if we open the restaurant up, if they allow us with the regulation, government regulation um, to they change the rules and we can sit closer, you know, not so far a distance, maybe three feet instead of six feet. He said, we still are unable to put all the tables back in the restaurant, even if we distance it. 
because he said, we won't be able to handle all this business in the kitchen. The kitchen isn't big enough to handle the business. And outside their restaurant, they have these um, storage, we call them pods in the United States. I don't know what the word is in, for you, Rania, but they look like little trailers, you know, that they put the furniture in and all of these, they have two pods like this outside the restaurant in the back where all the extra furniture is stored. And it's similar here, it's just the same name. Same thing. Yeah. So he said, you know, actually, we're doing better with COVID than we were before, or maybe similar, but he said, we can't handle the volume with the restaurant. And now everybody wants to go. And uh, so I think this is an interesting story. Now, unfortunately, a lot of businesses closed. They had no internet presence. And of course, everything is online delivery. So the world has changed, but this has created opportunities for others, for mail de meal delivery, for package delivery. So um, at any time anything happens in the world, it creates opportunities as well as challenges. And that's why it's so important to be entrepreneurial because you have to grab that opportunity, embrace the change. And what we know about entrepreneurs um, people trained in entrepreneurship and the skill set. I don't believe it's just a mindset. I believe it's a skill set that we have to teach. So not some some people uh, maybe are born, uh, maybe there's a little bit of born entrepreneurs. The British in UK have done some studies and they say about 30% or 40% is your cognitive, your brain's ability to be an entrepreneur. That means you react quickly, um, you embrace change, you are flexible, uh, you deal with the ambiguity or the uncertainty very well. Some people, if you know them, they're not good at this at all. I think it's an, a human trait for us not to be good at this. You know, we like everything the same. It, it creates more stress sometimes for us when it's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of uncertainty can be too much. There's been a lot of that. But our ability to embrace uncertainty and roll with the punches or, you know, um, look for opportunities during that period is a trait of entrepreneurs. And every organization, whether you start your own business or you work in a government business, government policy, you work in a government office, you work in a nonprofit organization, you work at a university, you work in, um, you know, uh, a for-profit organization, a company, they all need people that are entrepreneurial and creative in all they do, and they can deal with changes. And even if we look at the university, here at my university, we actually had people retire because they said, no, I, I've taught face-to-face -face my whole life. I don't wanna learn how to teach on the internet. I don't wanna deal with the internet. And they retired and others embraced it. They said, okay, I've never done this before. Uh, I know Rainia is an expert on this IT and, and this is her area. It's not my area, so, but, um, I had a opportunity about four or five years ago, the Dean came to me and said, you know, Diane, so many people can't get an education because they work two and three jobs. They're in the rural areas of our state and the country. And we should think about putting entrepreneurship online. So now I, I embraced that idea five years ago. And I said, okay, so we will work to get all the required courses face-to-face -face and online. Some people still prefer face-to-face -face and, and the elective, some of the electives. So if somebody is in a rural uh, town, they're doing farming that they can, or they have a small business in a town, then they can take them, get this education and get the degree. So we, I agreed to do this maybe five years ago. And, um, I am no internet expert and 
I learned. I learned with a very good teacher here, Dr. April Black, who's a computer whiz, and she helped me get all my courses online. And now I've been teaching maybe four or five years, 100% online. I miss the classroom, to tell you the truth. I miss my students, but I have faculty because I, I hire all the faculty and everything. And I have faculty that they they really don't want to do it on online. So they teach face to face and that's OK. So everybody's different. We have to make room for everybody. And, um, you know, and um, there's religious observances we all need to watch around the world. So, for instance, one of my faculty said, uh, no, I can't teach on Wednesday because this is her holy day. So she had so she doesn't work that day. So we're, we're, I think it's very, we have to be flexible. We have to be understanding. I think um, our relationships around the world as well as local, national, those are even more important than they were ever before. And we know how valuable that human relations is. And a good entrepreneur knows their relationships, they keep their relationships, they grow their relationships so that they always have this, this group of people that can help them to, that can come to their aid. So, um, so th I think this is very important as the human element. So I can tell you, we have a club called the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization, it's CEO, and it's a student club. And I asked two of my former students from 20 years ago to speak. And one has a number of businesses, a mortgage business in California and some retail clothing stores for women with his wife. And he spoke, he's, he used my student like 20 years ago. And then another student is in sales for the pharmaceutical industry and he also spoke. So I think these connections, I think, are very important um, to really entrepreneurs more than anybody because you build your knowledge level and your networking based on who you know and the, their, um, their, their knowledge base. What we know about entrepreneurs is that close family, close friends don't really help you to be entrepreneurial. They're always saying, no, you can't do this. What we do know is people that are acquaintances that we've learned known from clubs, they're not the closest friends, but they're friends. They're the ones that are more open. They're more open to ideas. They listen to you about these ideas more. And so that's very important to have a networking through all different kinds of connections and people. One thing we need to do is build something called the hero within us. And the hero within us, and I don't know, Ronnie, I sent you a PowerPoint slide. If you can put that up, that would be very helpful for the audience. They, I'll just keep talking while we're doing this. But the hero within us is something that we have within any person in any society around the world. And it is um, the more we have the hero within us, the higher our performance. And we've tested this with entrepreneurs around the world, the higher your ability to be an entrepreneur. But the higher you'll be successful in anything you do, higher performance. So no matter what industry you go into. So we're going to talk about the hero within and it's a tool to be a better entrepreneur. And second page, please, if you can turn it. So the hero within stands for hope. So we all need to develop goals and pathways. And, you know, the more hopeful we are, the more successful we will be. But this is really done lots of times by doing small goals and then bigger goals. So for instance, in my personal life, I set the goals every day. And this sounds very corny to most people are very, um, I don't know how to say it, but I take a little post-it note like this one and I 
write just one word on it at night before I go to sleep. And I put it in the mirror in my bathroom because in the morning, the first place I'm there is there in this room. And I see this and it's just one word lots of times like uh, take a walk or um, eat something healthy or, you know, make make some dessert or, or whatever it might be um, or finish the paper or do the assignment, whatever it might be. And then that's I see that and it's only sometimes one word. But it guides me the whole day because now I have a goal and I'm more committed to that goal to really carry it out for the day. And it's very simple and anybody can do it. And every night I do this, I take the old one down, I put a new one up and I think, okay, what am I going to do the next day? And that I think has a lot to do with my productivity also. Um, I have 112 refereed journal articles, some in uh, top tier financial times journals, as well as other stuff. But I think you could do these goals, personal as well as professional. Maybe you have a goal of praying every day. So maybe you're going to do extra prayers that day. So I think um, the goals can be personal as well as professional. But what we know about successful people is that they're goal oriented. What pathways means is there's a way to get to the goal. So if I wanna say, okay, I want to lose one pound of weight this week, a week, I think not a kilo because that would be too much. <laughs> uh, you're, I'm sure you're not on pounds, only the US is, but say I'm trying, and now I'm trying to do this because to be honest, with COVID, I, I have been home and when I'm home working, the refrigerator is right there. So I take a break and I go to the refrigerator. I don't know if you also have had this situation, but a lot of people in the United States have gained weight this time with COVID. Five pounds, I said it's COVID. Getting overweighted. Yeah, it's, it's terrible actually. And we call it the COVID 10 here in the US because most people have put on 10 pounds. Luckily, I didn't do that, but I'm trying to get down to my weight where I was before COVID. And I, I also had a surgery on my knee, knee replacement. So I was unable to be moving very much. Even now I'm, uh, you know, it's going on a year, but I'm not still a hundred percent. This slowed me down, but you're still hungry. You, so this is, so now I'm trying now to lose weight. So I've got this goal, you know, on my mirror in the morning, like, you know, health, the, you know, salad for dinner or salad for lunch and, you know, cut no desserts. And I'm trying to do this, but I have a pathway to that goal. So I have a long term um, to in this month to lose three pounds. OK, that's not very much, but. For me, it's a lot. So you you can't let other people judge your goals. It is between you and you to make these goals. But there's a clear pathway how I'm going to get to that goal. I need to cut down, eliminate desserts. I need to eliminate double helpings, second helping of food. I need to not go to the refrigerator when I'm home. <laughs> so there's a pathway to that goal that's clear to me. Okay, you can do that also with career goals. Um, you know, when you're going to get your degree, when you're going to finish this year, don't always try to make huge goals. They need to be short and attainable going towards a, the bigger goal. Like for students, when you're going to graduate, okay, this year I'm going to take, finish this semester and I'm going to take this. And so there's small steps always. The second part of hero is efficacy. Efficacy means I believe I can do this. It is confidence. I believe I can actually meet those goals. I think I can do it. There has been a lot of studies um, by Siegelman and other uh, academics outside the field of 
business actually in the field of physical training. And what they've found is you always wonder, they've done studies on athletes like for the Olympics and they say, no way with this person's body shape or this person's strength level that they could make it to the Olympics. But because they have very strong belief in their self and that confidence, and they set goals for themselves and pathways, they maybe work out five hours a day, they end up at the Olympics. And if you looked at their body size or, you know, maybe they're not so tall to play on the basketball team or their physique isn't something that it doesn't look like Hercules or something that they would, you would think no way will this person ever get where they're going. Maybe they're just a small person and then they get the gold medal. And they've studied these athletes because they were trying to figure out what is the difference in these people that can actually do this physically. And so the first studies were actually came out of physical, the, you know, um, the health area. And, and this is the first studies that were done on efficacy. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from adversity, something bad happening to us. Resilience is very important. I think I'm very high if I can share some personal story with you. I think my ability to be resilient my whole life has made a difference in my career. And um, I've had some adversity, some personal adversity. And um, I think I'm very resilient. And, and right now, I think this is a time resilience is even more important than ever, has ever been before. In academic studies, they're doing a lot of work on resilience, you know, in family businesses that are re more resilient. So what we know about family businesses is 95% of businesses around the world are family businesses. I would say in Egypt, it's probably even higher than that. Ronnie and it would know for sure. But there is a very high percentage. Ronnie, what would be the percentage of family businesses? Entrepreneurs here in Egypt is around from 60% to 70% of the running business here in, in the economy. So it is a huge percent. Yes. And many, many family, most family members work in that business. Yes, it is a family work. Most of it is a family work. Yeah. So aunts, uncles, brothers, cousins, you yes, know, exactly. extended family, the grandmother, Especially, um, especially women are more in entrepreneurs are called as an entrepreneurial rather than men. So the percentage is more in the women. Yes. Yeah. And that that might be from not as many opportunities or the ability to keep a business and then do the family life too. Yes. Would you would you agree with that, Rania? Totally, I agree with you. So resilience is very important. So I can tell you in my career, and um, I've had three endowed chairs. I've created three entrepreneurship centers at universities. I've created three, three or four academic programs in, uh, in entrepreneurship at different universities, and they're all very successful. And I actually go into universities and I create entrepreneurship programs for them as a consultant and do entrepreneurship across the curriculum. So entrepreneurship in engineering, entrepreneurship in the sciences, entrepreneurship in technology, entrepreneurship in the arts, entrepreneurship in music. Um, so because I believe that you, this is all all important, but my, in terms of resilience, um, I can tell you a very personal story. And I think that most people would think I'm successful. I think I'm successful, but when I was a, a young doctoral student, um, I was very anxious to get through the, my PhD program. So I can tell you a personal story. So you just don't think I have a big head and that bad things don't happen to me. 
um, I was very anxious to get through. And the reason for that, well, I wanted to get through anyway, like all of you out there that are students, you want to get through school so you can have a life and you can have a family and you can go on with your life. When you're in school, you, your life is on hold, especially in a PhD program, your life is on hold. You somehow have to manage everything, but you can't move forward until you get it done. And it's a lot of, you know, hard work. And I was in this program and I, I was divorced. I had a little girl I was raising by myself. Uh, my husband um, left. And this little girl, my little girl, Shannon, is now, she will be 39 years old this summer. And um, she, at the time when I started my doctorate, she was two and a half years old. So a long time ago. <laughs> um, and I'm very proud to say she's, um, she finished her specialist in, in special education. So she works with those that have learning disabilities. And uh, she's, but now she's, um, She's not working right now because her husband and her, they're expecting their fourth baby. And the good news is she's moving one hour from me. Uh, the husband's company offered him an opportunity about one hour away. He, he's, a, he's an oral surgeon. He does uh, teeth replacement, prosthodontist. Um, so they're moving close and she has, they have, they will have, four children under six years old. So <laughs> uh, she's not working right now, but she's been very successful and she's done some very wonderful things with her life. She um, was able to get uh, guide dogs, uh, dogs that help the learning disabled in the classroom at one of the biggest school districts in the United States and Florida when she was there. And so she's done some very good things with her life and I'm very proud of her, but um, when I was in school, it was very difficult because my family lived far away. They couldn't help me with her heart very much at all. My mother sometimes would come uh, for, but it would like be six hour drive and she didn't drive very well. And it was very, very difficult. And back then we didn't have the research and everything on the internet, I had to go to the library in person to get to the books and to get to the articles. And um, so it, if you can imagine taking a two and a half year old to the library and everybody has to be quiet, it didn't work so very well, even when I brought her toys and things. So I was very anxious to graduate and finish the degree and get on with the job and on with my life. So I, for her sake, um, was very important to me. So I was maybe hurrying a little bit too fast and I went up for something called a pre-proposal. This is something where we have to do a proposal for our dissertation, our big paper, but this was the pre-proposal It's sort of the step, a first step up the stairway. So, and then if they say, yeah, it looks good, then we go on. Well, I was the first one in my PhD group with the other students to do this. And I was in a big hurry and all the professors were there. All the students were there because none of them had done it and they wanted to see how it was done. And I got eaten alive. It was a disaster. The professor I was working under, I had a, a wonderful professor, Fred Luthans, who's very famous. He has top 1% one, 1 of all social citation index, the top in the world. Uh, he's very famous and actually Fred Luthans is the founder of the SCICAP survey. And if your university is interested, we can do this survey. It's very simple. It's 12 questions. I do it before the students start the class and then afterwards in entrepreneurship to see if that SCICAP rating went up, if the hero went up. Yes, that's going but, to be a little uh, and we could do it. Okay, great. That's great. Okay. I, I have some data from around the world and that would be interesting. Also, the students can see their scores. So the students like it because they can see where they started and where they end up. Um, but anyway, during this time, it was just a disaster. And everyone thought that, okay, 
you know, she, she did a, I mean, they just question after question and very hard. And I changed that. I changed advisors because I was doing another study on the hospital industry and I thought I could get through faster. So I changed advisors, dissertation advisor. Everyone thought she will never come back. She's going to quit the program. It was that bad. It was terrible. It was two hours of just pure eating me alive kind of thing. And I sort of gathered myself up. It was on a Friday and I gathered myself up over the weekend. I was very depressed. I was very upset. And I said, no, I am not going to quit. So I went back to my original professor, Fred Luthans, and I said, will you take me back? Will you take me back as your student? He agreed to take me back. He was there for me always. I would drop off the dissertation at night at, at his house, like in the afternoon, and he would call me like eight at night, nine o'clock at night in his office, and he would be helping me with it, you know, do this, do this, do this, do this. So, um, like I told you about support people, it's very important. And he's in his 80s now, and I'm still close to him. So that resilience, everyone thought I'd quit, but no, I went back in and um, I just, it was terrible. I was very embarrassing by the way, too, with all the professors and all the students and uh, everybody was looking down. So not to look at my face. <laughs> so I just carried on, you know, so that resilience is important in our life. Very important to be resilient. You can build resilience in yourself, by the way. You can build it up. And optimism is the last part. And that's being optimistic is making positive attributions and having positive future expectations. So you're optimistic about the future. What's going to happen to you? What, what's going to happen to your family? You know, good things. And we all need to have more optimism. It's been very hard, I think, during this time to be optimistic but now they have vaccines and I believe maybe, maybe six months from now, the world will be a much better place and hopefully everyone will be vaccinated and everybody will be okay. So it's the hero within us. And there is a 12 point scale that measures hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism. So, um, and you can build this up in yourself. There's actually some computer simulations to build your hero within you up. And so I think this applies to all, all students, all faculty, anyone is to be the hero within us. And they've done studies. And, and when I say studies, there's been like five, 600 around the world, every culture, every industry, private, for-profit, manufacturing, just everything. And with entrepreneurs, not just entrepreneurs, but there hasn't been as many studies with it with entrepreneurs as there's everything else. And it is very valid and reliable around the world with any industry. So this is a very valuable scale and it's 12 questions. Um, I think it helps us sort of monitor ourselves. And so with that, I want to end with you finding the hero within you and really working on those goals, those individual goal setting goals, but to have hope, efficacy, resilience and optimism and to know that any of you can be an entrepreneur with skill training and with that entrepreneurial spirit. So I'll, I'll open it up to questions now. Is there any questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Dan, for this amazing uh, lecture, webinar we have talking together. And yes, we could find here in ourselves, and this is the start point. So if any of my colleagues could ask a question, and our students as well. Any questions? Okay. Professor Lynch, and thank you very much. This is Mohamed Aziz at Kuzani, a dean of social and human sciences at our university. We are CD. 
I would like to thank you very much for this presentation and, uh, you know, um, the last point was very interesting for us as we do have a program for psychology. Optimistic is very important for us. I hope that we should, we should to be optimistic that COVID-19 will disappear very soon, as you mentioned, six months from now, but please think that Africa, except Egypt, they still don't have any vaccine now. You know? We started to produce Egyptian vaccines in cooperation with China, uh, with China, in order to cover the whole countries in Africa. Please think about, think about uh, seven billion people worldwide need to get vaccine. It's a big number, you know, but as you mentioned, but as you mentioned before, we should be op optimistic. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank, very you. Much. Thank you. And, um, and uh, I, I sometime would like to come to Egypt because I know it's a very beautiful country with a very rich history. And yes. I hope that the rich countries share the vaccine. I know we just sent a lot to Canada, but Canada in comparison is a rich country too. But I think the Gates Foundation is trying to work to get the vaccines. I've invited a colleague from South Africa to, to come work with me. She asked and I said yes and on women entrepreneur studies. And she still one year later can't come because, well, because of COVID no one can travel, but be, their vaccines, they're still in lockdown. Um, and, and they don't have vaccines there. So it's, it's really, we have to look at the whole worldwide situation and try to do something about this now because in the future, we have to have a plan. So we can distribute vaccines to all the countries in the world. And how are we gonna do that in the best way? Hopefully, hopefully yeah. we're going to receive this vaccine. Later. So we could return back to normal life within all the future we are willing to get back with the positives, as Dr. Muhammad was saying, and you was mentioned in your presentation. So if any of our students got another question related to? Dr. Menna uh, is going to ask you. Um, Dr. Welsh, how are you? Hi, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Um, I just have one question. Um, the role that business incubators play for the entrepreneurial uh, uh, potential. Uh, those uh, uh, young people who have good ideas, but they are not quite uh, aware that they can develop them enough uh, to um, establish their startup, uh, or those who need some help with uh, their ideas uh, or some other help to, to begin their startup. Uh, we already have business incubator today. Um, either affiliated to public universities or some kind of uh, other not-for-profit not organizations. But I just need to know uh, your um, uh, perspective, your uh, uh, main support, and uh, that you believe these business incubators should be doing. Okay, so uh, the... the, the um, Sound went out a little bit. So the question is, what do I think about incubators? Uh, yes, the the idea, uh, the main support that they should be providing, and if you believe there there could be more support here for business yes. incubators to provide to yes. young people who want to start their startups. Yes, yes. I, I think this is very important. 
And um, what I know about Egypt is there's a lot of young people that are unemployed. Is this correct? Yes. So um, the incubator support from the government for incubators and nonprofits for this is very important. However, I do believe that there's a lot we can do before the business or the individuals get to the incubator that we're probably not doing very well. And this is all over the world, not just in any particular country in that we need to um, train our classes, to train students, to take it from idea to opportunity to action. So when we get to the incubator, they're taking it to action. Maybe in small ways, we have an incubator here in our city, but they need to do the business model, the feasibility, is it an idea or is it really an opportunity? We all have good ideas. Not all of them are opportunities. And then opportunity to action. What we know from research is that if the business, potential business, does the feasibility analysis where they look at, is it a good idea or is it really an opportunity? And there's a written plan, you know, plan before they take it to the business plan, that it improves the chances of success just by doing that by 60%, 60%. So most of the time people just talk about business plans and they know about business plans. The first step is not the business plan. The business plan, we've already decided to do it. We've determined it's an opportunity and we're taking it to action. And the incubator would be the action piece. Before that, they need to just get from idea to opportunity and do a written analysis of the market, of opportunities, of the industry. And we can do that at universities. And we, we have classes here in that. So I have a class, you know, a business model, which is very simple for the whole campus. It's open to all 20,000 students. And they take their... مفتوح ولا ايه؟ مفتوح مفتوح بس عندها هي؟ طب ادخل على الايفون؟ لا معرفش تفتكروا يا جماعه منظرنا بقى وحش؟ تفتكروا يا جماعه منظرنا وحش قدام الاجانب؟
Diane, could you turn on your uh, cam, please? Diane, could you turn on your uh, your your cam? Can you hear me? I think you got a problem within the internet, so. طب استناها دقيقتين هي احنا خلصنا احنا في اول ديان كنت تي هير مي بسبب المسج في الميتنج راح المسج اوكي بسبب المسج بقى بس ما ميوتد Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, okay. sorry about that. Technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. I don't know what happened. It was all of a sudden it was gone. Okay, no, no, you are online. So we got an, another question from one of our students. Again. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, so, you were so you were just talking about the vaccine and you said that you had it. Um, I just had a question because um, um, I want to take the vaccine when it comes to Egypt, but I'm, I'm just scared because I've heard so, so many rumors about the vaccine that it has so many side effects. So, um, so I just want to ask, um, um, what, um, yeah. Yes, come on, come on. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. What, what side effects that I had yeah. with it personally? No, I mean, um, weren't you scared of the side effects when you decided to take the vaccine? No. And the reason is because the, the, the COVID-19 is so much worse than the side effects. So I got the Moderna vaccine the first time, the first shot, I only hit a sore arm. I did it on the left because I write with my right, maybe sore arm for two days, maybe that's it. No other side effect. Second day, second shot, I woke up about three in the morning and I was very hot. And this maybe lasted two hours and that was it. The next, I was a little tired the next day and by Monday I was fine. So, you know, I can tell you that my husband, um, he, he had an employee that was the payroll person. She's 48 years old. She got COVID from her son who worked in an adult daycare center. And she was in the hospital three weeks. Then, now, still, as of today, she is still on oxygen in her home and can't come to work. And she's 48 years old and pretty healthy. Maybe a little overweight, a little bit, but not terrible. And, um, you know, so I can tell you for young people, all my students here in the office, let me tell you this, all my students that work for me in the office, all five of them, they all got the vaccine. And they got the Johnson & Johnson because that was what was available on campus. And um, and they had no trouble, none of the five. Um, they're more your age, you know, they're, they're 20, 21, 22 in this area. So the young people have had less thing, occurrence, but it's much worse with the vaccine. Even this week, with the prevalence of vaccines in the United States, we've had 10 people this week die in the county. So, so it, 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 it's, it's very dangerous. It's much worse getting COVID than getting the shot. 
So you shouldn't be afraid. And I have to tell you, sometimes the news media builds things up too much. I mean, yes, if you have a lot of allergies in your system, that's a different situation. Maybe you have to consult your doctor, but if you're just a normal person, it's it's not any big deal. So don't don't be afraid. Okay, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Good luck to you. Good luck with your studies. Okay, thank you, Diane, for your interesting um, lecture. Really, it was amazing, and thank you so much for accepting uh, my invitation that you are going to give us this brief in this time. I know this is your uh, very busy and hopefully the next time that you are going to join us at Galala University here in Egypt uh, this is one of the amazing places you will ever see um, in Egypt the sea and the mountains and the sunny days everything here is amazing so you are going to like it so the next time I'm going to invite you here to Galala University to join our social life here and to give us a, a, life, a life lecture instead of this online one all right. I would look forward to that. And you're an amazing professor, Rania. So I look forward to that and to meet all the Egyptians. I've heard such great things about you all. And we have one restaurant in Greensboro that has Egyptian food. And uh, so I've tried it. It's very good and uh, maybe very different for us. But I look forward to meeting you all and seeing how we all can work together and also meeting the students. So I wish you all good luck and blessings and everything for a good day. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Nice to meet you and to see you once again. Goodbye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye-bye.